Greetings. Greetings, everyone. I say peace, love, light, and honor to you all. I say welcome. Welcome to all that would be watching, to all that would be joining. I say peace and love to you all to you all once again and may you all have or is having a wonderful day uh, may all be well with you and your loved ones honor honor to you all so we're going to get into it today and we're going to break down the history of the people who are now identifying as indigenous to the Americas called Tainos. And we're gonna break down their true origin and who they truly are and way, where they truly come from. And how it has been and through philo philotropical, philotropical or philanthropy philanthropical backing of elite families and governments throughout the years that they have come together to write one set of people out of history and put in another set of people in their place in history, which is a part of what is called the Great Reset. And all of this is being done for land, property, right, birthright. So we're going to get into it. I want to play a video first of Rome, a guy that's breaking down Rome in this video in 20 minutes. And there's parts of this video that I'm going to point out. Um, and then those parts that I point out, we're going to get into it and start making the connection from there on into the Taino people because it's it's important. They're not from the Americas. These people are Asiatic people. They are descendants of Rome, Spain, and what you would now call China and these different parts of that part of the world, okay, which equals to the Asiatic man and woman. That's them, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna get into it because their timeline, what they've been doing, was using Gates money, Soros money, and creating organizations been put into positions of power into our histor into the historical archival records and they've been changing the history they've been rewriting these documents and publishing them out on this on the on the on the web okay but if you still could get the old books the books that even the french the Germans and the Dutch wrote in their languages going back to the 13, 14, 1500s. And you start translating those books and get get a translator to translate those books. If you have a friend or two that speaks or know how to read the language, they can translate it for you. And you, you'll see that it mentions nothing of the people in the Americas being called Taino. So what these folks have been doing, because they're descendants from colonial forces that has colonized the Americas. And I always use Haiti as the prime example because Haiti was named Hispanolia, so they say by Columbus. And that name is very important to the history of the people who they now call Taino. Because Haiti, Hispanolia, is not even the original name of Haiti. It's just the name that Columbus, they say, came and gave Haiti. And the reason why that name is because that name breaks down also a core of where these people come from. And Hispanolia goes back to Hispano and Hispano goes back into the whole Taino thing, which means those of Spanish descent. Now, if those are those of Spanish descent and the Spaniards were the very first invaders of the Americas, 
Yeah. The Spaniards are the very first invaders of the Americas. Then how can you come and claim to be indigenous to the Americas? How can you come and claim to be the original people of the Americas when the very name that you're going by, when people do the, the research on these on the definitions of these names, they'll see that it literally means that you are a colonial colonial force or entity on these lands in these Americas. But let's start off with this with the Greek video. Let me um hit the screen share and pull it up for you guys. Give me one second, family. All right, so we're going to, this is a video called Ancient Rome in 20 Minutes, okay? Uh, and this is from, what's that? Arzamas, so I say fair use, fair use, fair use. Ever since, ever since I did the, the last video uh, stream, breaking down this and the history of the slave trade and these things, especially for the coolie people. I've been getting a lot of uh yeah weird um yeah a lot of weird phone calls a lot of weird uh activity on my um in my emails yep and a lot of weirdos in my comment section also weirdo but let's let's um let's go at it. Fair use, fair use. Let's let's play this. Here are the letters the Romans gave us, and here are the countries whose languages derive from Latin. Today they cover half the world. As for the ancient Romans, the boundaries of their state encompassed their entire civilization. The Roman peace, or Pax Romana, serves as the first example of globalization. Let's take a walk across 12 centuries of the Roman history. And yes, those numerals are also a Roman legacy. Let me point out. Let's blow this up. You see this statue here? I'm going to show you how they do us. So they broke off the nose and they broke off the top lip. But even this statue, you can't hide the fact that this was what was called a Negro man, right? A man of, of particular um, phenotype, right? But anyway, let, let's, let's, let's keep going, though. You see. What is Rome? A city on seven hills, capital of Italy. But that is today, and 2,000 years ago, there it is. Another 1,000 years ago, there. A tiny tribal settlement of the Latins by the River Tiber. How did this manage to conquer the world? First, it was lucky with its neighbors. To the north, the Etruscans of modern Tuscany, a mysterious people whose language has never been fully deciphered. To the south, Greek colonies. These peoples all traded with each other. It was at the crossroads of their trade routes that Rome appeared. From the very start, Rome has been an open city, a safe haven for outcasts, murderers, runaway slaves. Rome offered migrants a unique opportunity to become fully-fledged citizens. This will make Rome the largest metropolitan city of the ancient world. The Romans themselves believed they were descendants of refugees from the Middle East who had survived the Trojan War. Romulus and... Now, you see why this is important? Because they already made the, the Spaniard link already with the Romans, right? And now they're putting in the Middle Eastern link also as well. So if you go back to, I believe it's the last stream that I did when I, the last stream or the stream before last, when I was showing you the connection between them that these folks identify as East Asian and West Asian. So the, your folks from the Middle East and your folks from like Syria 
in these places, they identify as Asian, okay? And when you go back into the history of um, Mongo uh, of the Mongol Empire of Mongolia, there's parts of Mongolia that was called Manchuria, which is now occupied or taken over by the Chinese and the Russians now today, okay? Manchuria. Um, now when you go <laughs> even more further back in history, you're going to see that uh, the term Africa was was never in existence before. It was a it's a corporate construct that was created, like the term Jamaica. You know what I mean? Is a corporate construct uh, created by colonial force or descendants of colonial forces to um, lock in uh, the people under a corporate contract unknown to them to make them wards or put them underneath the jurisdiction of that corporate contract. And whoever owns that contract or that corporate entity has jurisdiction over the people because they don't know, right? So before all of that was called Africa, it was called Asia at one point. It was called Asia before it was called Africa. So this is important. So this first about two minutes of this video it's when you go back to the last live and you're going to see also doing this one where the connection comes in. Remus were the great grandchildren of the Trojan hero Aeneas. Nursed by an Italian she-wolf, the brothers quarreled where to site the future world capital. Romulus killed Remus, gave his name to the city and became its first ruler. As legend has it, there were seven kings, each of which enjoyed a lengthy reign and left some beneficial legacy. A calendar, a sewer system, or the Capitolium, a temple to the senior god Jupiter. Much of what the Romans later became famous for, aqueducts, bridges, perhaps even the gladiatorial games, were borrowed from the Etruscans. This people had invented the Latin alphabet by adapting the Greek letters for their own needs. It's not surprising that... Now, see, pay attention. So... They literally, so these people, they said, created the Latin alphabet, right? With the merger of the Greek language as well, right? This is why now when you're looking up like um, old Spaniard languages that always go back into old Greek, ancient Rome, these type of things. This is where the origin is because this is why, this is where the origin of the language comes from, right? Of their language comes from. This is it right here. That their last kings were Etruscan. Rome borrowed her military and government organization from them while maintaining her stern patriarchal simplicity. In 509, Rome was shaken by a sex scandal. The son of King Tarquin the Proud raped the chaste Lucretia. Tarquin was expelled, making him the last king of Rome. <laughs> The Romans decided to prevent any such concentration of power ever again. From 509 onwards, they elected two consuls to serve a year apiece instead of a monarch. The consuls were controlled by the Senate. This consisted of 300 fathers, patris in Latin, hence the term patricians. Those not so lucky to be born into the right families joined the plebs. Even if they were as rich as patricians, they were not entitled to take up positions in the state. It is in the 200 year struggle for these rights that the Republic, literally meaning public thing, will be formed. The plebeians would make up the backbone of the army and to have their own way, they would threaten the fledgling state with emigration to a neighboring hill. Each time the scared patricians caved in, introducing, for instance, the special position of a representative or tribune of the plebeians. These had the right to veto any decisions of the consuls. One of the main achievements of the struggle was the publication of the first written laws. By 287 BC, the plebeians had achieved complete equality of rights with the patricians. The unity of Rome found its best expression in the formula Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and the Roman people, which still adorns the manhole covers in Rome.
In 390 BC, the history of Rome could have come to an end. The city was unexpectedly taken by the Gauls. The guard dogs had sensed no danger, for which they would be crucified every year since. Geese awoke the last protectors of the Capitoline Hill fortress instead, saving Rome from complete destruction. The shaken Romans conducted the military reform. The Roman legion was divided into manipuli, making it more mobile in battle. The Roman army spent the next hundred years in constant wars. Instead of simply imposing a tribute on the conquered, the Romans would enter into a treaty of alliance with them, and the loyal allies supply Rome with a never-ending stream of recruits. Thanks to this, the Roman legions were able to stand their ground in battle with the most efficient fighting force. So what, what you're seeing and um, what is being breaking down to you so far is that the Romans were a mixed um, nationality group of people, right? Uh, with Spanish and Middle Eastern uh, admixtures as well. So these are the Romans. Now <laughs> we're going to re we're going to review back this video in another live stream to break down something else as well, right? But let's let's continue. Let's keep going. Of the time, the all-conquering Macedonian phalanx, led by Pyrrhus, a relative of Alexander the Great, the last stronghold of resistance in Italy, the Greek city of Tarentum, then hired the most costly and celebrated contemporary warlord of the time to defend against Roman expansion. Having conquered Tarentum and reached Sicily, Rome now had to take on a much more dangerous adversary, Carthage. Lord of the Mediterranean. The Romans called the Phoenicians of Carthage Punics, hence the Punic Wars. They were fought over the next hundred years. In what I will show you how everything in history is being rewritten to look one way. Look at this mirror that they're showing. Look at the complexion of the people, right? But when you go and you look into the historical archaeological um, records, you will see that these people were not these complexions. These people were dark skin and brown skin people going against each other. This is this is what it was. So what you're looking at here now, this is a whole refabricated imagery of what this war of what this war looked like. Right? These people are riding on the backs of elephants right now today. So these are the 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 Indian people or the Hindu people. Of what they call it of of Calcutta, India, whatever it want to be, it, it wants to be called, right? And what do what do those people still look like to this very day? To show you the rewrite of history, why paint this whole imagery like this? Why do this? Because it's a theft going on of identity going on. On 49 BC, Rome had taken the greater part of Punic territory and that of their allies. But after each defeat, the trading power of Carthage would rapidly recover. Senator Cato, the elder, began to finish every speech with the same refrain, Carthage must be destroyed. And so it was done. The city was wiped out, all of its population was enslaved, allegedly plowing salt into the air as an eternal curse. Also in 146 BC, the Romans wiped out another city, Corinth, making Greece and Macedonia Roman provinces. Rome appropriated the colossal riches of the disintegrating empire of Alexander, but the patriarchal simplicity of Rome succumbed to the sophisticated Greek culture. Greek became, in effect, a second state language. The Roman nobility busied itself learning new words, hexameter, history, rhetoric. Cicero, the most famed orator of Rome, would come to model his speeches on those of the Greek Demosthenes. However, across this immense territory, full rights were only afforded to the Romans themselves, even other Italians. Now look, again, you see how they destroyed the imagery of this statue here? And you could tell, you could tell what this was. You could tell, you could tell. You see what I'm saying? The rewrite of history to write dark-skinned people out of history. It's ridiculous. You understand? This is this is what's this is what is going on to rewrite dark skinned people out of history and people with particular phenotypes off uh, off a dark or brown you out of history.
Jews. The majority of the military had no citizenship rights. These would demand equality, declare war, and win the right to take part in managing the state. This was a total game changer. While ancient Greece remained a collection of squabbling city-states, Rome gradually extended citizenship rights to the conquered, laying down the basis for an empire. Having conquered half the world, Rome fell victim to globalization. Cheap grain and an inflow of unpaid slave labor bankrupted the small farmers. These rushed into the cities and joined the ranks of the proletariat, those who have nothing to lose except their own offspring. At the same time, the rich grew a hundred times richer, having bought land from the ruined peasants for a song. Previously united, the Senate and the Roman people split into two hostile camps. The tribunes of the people, the Gracchi brothers, would try to reconcile them. They proposed granting excess public lands to the impoverished peasants and suggested free distributions of bread to the poor. The disgruntled senators decided to suppress the Gracchi movement by force, killing the brothers and several thousand of their allies. Rome was gripped by civil wars. Social mobility for the proletariat was offered by Gaius Marius, a popular general. He began enrolling the proletariat into the army with a promise of a grant of land at the end of service. This would make the legions personally... Now, when you go back to my, my last live, right? I tell you of the strategy that they use to pull in uh, millions of indentured servants here into the Americas. They offered them land for their service. There were those that they offered land for service, the volunteer, the vol the ones that volunteered for indentured servitude, which is slavery. They offered them to give them land, like in the Caribbean, with the Cooley people. They gave them each about five acres of land. And then the houses of the indigenous people of the land that they took from the indigenous people through warfare, the ones that was down towards the waterfront, they gave those houses to those people and gave them the land after uh, five to seven years of free labor. They gave that to them. Right. And this that, that was incentive to pull in more and more and more people across to come across the waters to make that travel, to come across the waters to take a population in these lands. If you watch now today of what they're doing now with the migrants that has come over from Mexico, they've they they've they've dropped certain certain laws so that folks can get a driver's license. They can get driver's license non-driver's ID to lead to them getting their permit and their driver's license. And then they put them in positions to drive Uber, Lyft, um, DoorDash, these type of jobs, taxi jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Now they give them, now today they're giving them um, hotels, fancy hotels they, that they call them migrant hotels in like the heart of Manhattan in these things, right? They're giving them free housing, free food, free all of these things they're giving them because these are incentives to repopulate back here the americas to push out the rightful indigenous people of the americas now these people that are coming in from um libya uh afghanistan um all uh, all over the world china these people here in this one video it is showing you that Back in these times, in those times here, all those people have done came together and created an admixture, which is what we now today call the Asiatic man. Okay? So these people that you see coming in over from even Mexico, they're not the indigenous people of South America neither. They're the descendants of these folks here that's being broken down in this video. Okay? And those people... Are, are the same people who are on the reservations and who are now today calling themselves Taino and saying that they're indigenous to the Americas. They're not, unless they integrated within the bloodline of the indigenous folk here in the Americas. 
And for majority of the time, they stay segregated from us for hundreds of years, populating only with each other. Right? So let's let's continue to play the video. You know, I just don't want to get hit with the copyright, so I got a comment over it. But here we go. We devoted to the generals. In 49 BC, two outstanding generals fought over Rome. Gnaeus Pompeius had won the eastern provinces for Rome, including restless Judea, cleared the Mediterranean of piracy, defeated Spartacus' slave revolt, and justifiably added the title Great to his name. Gaius Julius Caesar had conquered Gaul. Nowadays, they would call it genocide. He butchered a million Gauls and enslaved as many more. He went on to defeat the Germans and then invaded Britain. According to the law, a general had to dismiss his legions before returning to Rome and in return have his moment of glory, a triumphal entry into the capital to the applause of the citizens. Caesar performed a hitherto unseen maneuver. He refused to submit to the Senate and having crossed the Italian border, the river Rubicon, marched his legions to Rome. Now, when they said that Hitler crossed the Italian border, that part is very important to what I'm going to bring up later on. Now, that's another mixture right there that came in right there because, you know, there was a lot of, you know, you know, bumping and grinding going on and a lot of stuff going on. All those Roman soldiers uh, that was already mixed with other because Rome is just one big melting pot of many different races ethnicity of people that's what rome was right um so now they walk they, they're marching through the italian border so they got to go through italy you see where i'm going here with this 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 is important this is important let's go I, I'm, I'm glad i found this video it would take him several years to defeat pompey the great and his other rivals pitting roman legions against each other in the process caesar annexed new territories and gave Cleopatra the Egyptian throne. After a romantic cruise along the Nile, she would give birth to Caesarion, or Little Caesar. On his return... Now, remember, Cleopatra was a biracial woman, they say, right? Um, half Negro, half Caucasian is what they say about Cleopatra, okay? Caesar would add Imperator, or Emperor, to his name title originally meaning victorious commander and gain control of all political positions consul tribune of the people and dictator rumor spread that caesar wanted to declare himself king conspiracy was brewing in the senate and caesar was assassinated caesar left his wealth quite unexpectedly for all concerned to his grand nephew 19 year old gaius octavius this octavian immediately joined in the power struggle in 31 BC, he defeated his last rival, the warlord Mark Anthony, who likewise had an affair with Cleopatra. The lovers would take their own lives. Octavian was left sole ruler of a vast territory. Julius Caesar ruled for four years. Octavian, assuming the title Augustus, meaning the venerable or the great, ruled for an endless 43 years. He didn't formally abolish the Republic. He simply took control of all possible positions, making his power almost absolute. But he modestly called himself Princeps, the first senator. And even though skirmishes with barbarians continued along the borders, inside them, the period of Pax Romana set in, a period of peace and stability that was to last 200 years. The empire experienced an economic upswing. Bread was just... See the complexion of the folks? See the pigment in the paint? You see it? You see the pigment in the paint? And you see where they're sort of lightening out the pigment, changing out the pigmentation color? See that? And then where they couldn't have chipped out? And this face right here is totally like you, you can't make this stuff up. Distributed for free to 200,000 people. On Augustus' orders, a 500 meter basin was dug at the very center of the capital, where 3,000 gladiators mimicked sea battles on real seagoing vessels. In Rome, construction was booming. Concrete and multi story districts were growing. Augustus had to introduce height regulations, limiting skyscrapers to six floors, 
and still the citizens were unhappy. They complained about traffic jams, pollution of the waters of the Tiber, and high rents. The golden century of poetry dawned. Mycenaeus, a quasi-minister of regulations, limiting skyscrapers to six floors, and still the citizens were unhappy. They complained about traffic jams, pollution of the waters of the Tiber, and high rents. The go Could you buy a villa by the sea in Hispania for this? <laughs> the century of poetry dawn. Mycenaeus, a quasi minister of culture, allocated special grants to praise the value of the state. Temples would be built in the honor of Augustus, and even a month was named after him. Thus, the cult of the Roman emperors was emerging. They would come to be venerated alongside Mars and Jupiter. After Augustus' power became hereditary, the senatorial opposition has left us vivid portraits of the first emperors. Suspicious Tiberius unleashed terror under the pretext of the law on treason. Under this law, any action could be deemed offensive. It was enough not to sufficiently praise the emperor or pay at a brothel with coins bearing his portrait. In distant Judea, a preacher refusing to worship the emperor as God was crucified. Now let's go back here. Let's, let's play this back real quick. Show you. In distant Judea. A... Now, you see, if you look at these faces, look at this. These are, again, Negro people. And remember I told you about the hanging of the tree, why they do the hanging of the tree? Because it represents uh, Yahshua as he was hung from the tree and not crucified on a cross. This here, the crucifixion of the cross, this here is a is a Christian um, concept, right? This is what this is. This is the corporate structure. This here is the original killing, lynching of Yahshua on what is the holy tree, which is the holy tree, which is what they used to make holy, one of the core ingredients into making holy water. Okay? This here. Let's keep going. A preacher refusing to worship the emperor as God was crucified. Caligula wanted to make his horse a consul. A scholar and gourmet, Claudius, was too occupied. Again, pay attention. Look at the image. See, this is the original portion of the painting here. Do you see how dark this man is? Do you see how dark this man is? This is this man's complexion. And, and you come over here. This is the hand of the woman right here. See? They, this is what they were doing also in Mexico in the Mayan and the Aztec temples, changing the complexions, lightening out everything. This is what they've been doing. Let's keep going. Occupied with feasting and the reforming of the alphabet to keep an eye on court intrigue. One of his wives, Messalina, was giving women of easy virtue a run for their money in the brothels. And the other, Agrippina, poisoned Claudius with mushrooms to enthrone her son from another marriage, Nero. Nero, believing that he was a born actor, not an emperor, would later kill his own mother, and then allegedly the apostles Peter and Paul. Then he again, allegedly, set fire to Rome, so as to read the verses on the fall of Troy during the blaze. He would accuse the first Christians of arson, and initiated their persecution. And finally, he took his own life. Most details of this era are known from Tacitus, a historian and senator who observed the degradation of Republican institutions. The fate of the empire was now decided not so much by the Senate as by the Praetorian Guards, the emperor's personal security force, created back in the times of Augustus. These suffocated Tiberius with a cushion, slayed Caligula by the sword, and hailed Claudius emperor. In all fairness, at the same time, the empire grew, expanding into new territories. Roman legions conquered part of Britain, where they founded a town called Londinium. Provinces were given a transparent taxation system, and the non-Roman nobility began to enter the Senate en masse. A grandchild of an Italian peasant, Vespasian Flavius, would become the founder of the next dynasty. 
Vespasian and Titus, suppressing the uprising in Judea, committed genocide again according to modern day not roman standards and reduced the temple of jerusalem to nothing but the wailing wall on a lighter note vespasian had a jolly good roman predisposition he taxed the collectors of urine at the public toilets and titus the destroyer of jerusalem would nevertheless obtain the title of merciful after a splendid triumph he opened the Colosseum for the people titus would be called the love and consolation of humankind and after such festivities had depleted the public treasury, Vesuvius destroyed Pompeii, plague devastated half Italy, and Titus became a god. The second century would go down in history as the era of the good emperors. Trajan was considered by his contemporaries the best emperor ever. Rome became a million strong city and the empire reached its largest extent. Rome connected on new territories via a network of paved roads. This system still determines the transport map of Europe. After Trajan's conquest, Hadrian busied himself with defense, erecting massive fortifications in Britain and between the Rhine and the Danube. Pantheon was built in Rome, the first temple to be topped by a massive dome, a real architectural sensation of the day, dedicated to all the gods. Hadrian would also include his lover among them, the young Antinius. More of his images have survived than of any Roman. The last good emperor, the throned philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, would spend most of his reign on military expeditions. In between battles, he wrote his manifesto for Stoic philosophy, Meditations. It was under Marcus Aurelius' son, Commodus, that the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, came to an end. He preferred a gladiator's glory to the affairs of state. Conspirators had the emperor strangled by a fellow fighter, the slave Narcissus. Rome sank into chaos. The next hundred years brought a sequence of random emperors proclaimed by the army, taking their turn on the throne, were a liberated slave, a fortune seeker who bought the throne at an auction, general Punic descent who would place statues of the former enemy, Hannibal, all over the empire, a Syrian priest of the sun, and a former shepherd who owed his popularity to his powerful physique. In 212, Emperor Caracalla, half North African, half Syrian, granted Roman citizenship to nearly all free subjects of the empire. The idea that you could be a Roman in Judea and Africa. <coughs> now, here they said half North African, half Syrian, right? So, what is what what are, what are the the complexion of the people in Northern Africa? Majority of them. See what I'm saying? Back then, same goes for the complexion of the people in Syria, too. Or any other corner of the empire at all might well be the main legacy of Rome still in use today. By mid-century, Rome was already in the midst of such a crisis that the whole provinces were starting to split off. The Gauls, for instance, proclaimed an empire of their own. Order would be restored by the son of a liberated slave, Diocletian. Having started his career as a soldier, he would end up an absolute monarch, an astonishing example of social mobility. Diocletian split the empire into four, with four co-rulers at four capitals, situated closer to the frontier. Rome lost its significance. The Senate became a town council. The country was now ruled by an army of officials personally reporting to the emperor. Thus, the ancient world, centered around the concept of a free community and free citizens, came to an end. From the princeps, the first senator, the emperor, had become the dominus, a title by which slaves addressed their masters. The citizen became a subject, the warrior turned into a soldier, and the farmer a semi-serf. Diocletian himself resigned from the post of emperor 20 years later and went off to his estate to grow cabbages. So pretty much the citizenship system that you are now living in here in these Americas, this is that's where it came from. So it's like they let you also know that you are serf, a ward of the state now. You're no longer free men and women. All right. <laughs> Thank you.
After Diocletian's departure, the co-rulers were fighting for power. Constantine, the future Saint Constantine the Great, emerging victorious. Before the crucial battle for Rome, he allegedly had a vision of a cross. After this, he made all religions equal. After 300 years of persecutions, the Christian... It's important because Constantine is where the, the Christ, the creation of Christ or Christianity also came from, right? came out of the catacombs and were now entitled to build churches alongside the temples of Augustus and Mars. Constantine would take the cross from Jerusalem to the new capital of the Roman Empire, Constantinople. Theodosius I would make Christianity the official religion and begin to destroy the ancient temples. He would also be the last emperor of a united Roman Empire. His sons split the empire into west and east. The eastern half would live another thousand years and is known to us as Byzantium. The western part would fall victim to the great migration of peoples. Rome, founded by migrants, would fall to the onslaught of a new wave of refugees. Ironically, the last... What's happening out here today? A new wave of refugees. I'm not saying that this is Rome, but I'm showing you that the pattern of what's happening today is the same thing that happened yesterday. Understand, history always repeats itself. These people stick to the same plan, the same everything. They don't change anything. The only thing that changes is the mindset of every generation that comes into play throughout history. You have some generations that's just got a degenerative mindset, and you got some generations that are just spot on. The last ruler of Rome would be called Romulus. In modern Rome, not far from the Colosseum, in the ruins of the Forum, there is a tomb. Its occupant was neither emperor nor senator, but a simple baker called Eurysachus. Likely born a slave into a family of Greek migrants, he later entered into a bread supply contract with the capital and became so rich that he could build such a monument for himself and his wife. Before Rome, in ancient Egypt and elsewhere, or after Rome, during the Middle Ages, a man would die in the same station in life as he had been born in. The life and career of Eurysachus is an answer to the question of how Rome was able to create a global state that lasted over a thousand years. All right, now let's, let's, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So in this video, you saw the Latin connection with the Greek, with the Roman, right? Then he also hinted also towards the Ottoman um, Empire as well, which are the Turks. Um, then you saw the link between the them in North Africa through the bloodlines within this uh, video here. And this is, is going to go into the whole Taino thing, right? Now we're, we're heading there now. Give me one second, family. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Well, they said that they did tamper greatly with the timeline. So what is 325 could possibly be originally 1325, right? So, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, so much to share. Which one of these would I start with? Which should I start with? Oh. Uh. Let's do this. Let's do this one right here. Uh, just put a one in the chat if you guys can see the screen share. All right, so this is a dictionary of Greek and Roman geography, 1854, right? 
and the what's that William Smith L L D E D. Now this is Tadinum, Tadinum, or Tadinas near Gualdo, a town of Umbria, mentioned by Pliny among the municipal towns of that region. It is not noticed by any other ancient author previous to the fall of the Western Empire. Remember they said Rome was split into what? Two portions east and west of the empire, right? But it is name, but its name is repeatedly found in the epistles, in the epistles of Gregory the Great, and it is ev evidently the same place called by Procopius Tagene, near which the Gothic king Totila was defeated by Norse in a great battle in which he was himself mortally wounded AD 552. The site is clearly fixed by the discovery of some ruins and other ancient momentum monuments in 1750 at a place about a mile and a half from Gualdo, where there is an old church consecrated in the Middle Ages to Sta Maria de Tadino. Gualdo is about nine miles north of Nocera, or Nucera, Nuceria close to the line of the Flaminian way. Hence, there is little doubt that we should substitute Tadinas for Patinius, a name obviously corrupt, given in the Jerusalem itinerary as a station on the Flaminian way. This is important because Tadinum and Gualdo is important. We're going to get into that right now. Because remember, they said that Rome crossed, crossed the borders of Italy in the video. Rome crossed the borders of Italy in the video. No, Gualdo Tadinum or Gualdo Tadino is a town in Italy. Okay. Let's or. Uh, let's go, let's go. Right. Let me close that real quick. Let me stop the screen share. About to get into another portion of the screen share. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me see if this is it. There we go. Keytoumbria.com. Gualdo Tadino Ancient History. Bronze Age finds from Gualdo Tadino. In an article of 2012, in Nuevo Serra Santa, Augusto Bosi recalled how, as a young boy in seven or a young boy of seven or eight in the early 1930s, he discovered a hoard of ancient objects while playing by the path near his home that led from the valley. De Santo Marzio to the Fonte della Rochetta. 
slightly to the north of the modern city. His father kept the artifacts for a while before showing them to a local historian, Ruggiero Goreri, who promptly bought them. They fortunately found their way to the archaeological collection of Per Perugai, per, per, Perugia, and are now in the Muso Archaeological Na, Nazionale there. I guess that's the museum. These are the artifacts. This is important. Now it's also going to go down into the whole Moors or Mori or Mori. The hoard, which consists of 59 mostly bronze objects, had been placed in a small cavity that had been dug into rock. Traces of human remains suggest that the objects came from one or more violated graves. That means they grave rob. Violated graves, they grave rob. They include violin bow shaped fibulas, spiral hairpins, tweezers, needles, and other artifacts. However, pride of place goes to two lovely gold leaf discs inscribed with geometric patterns. It is possible that they were used in rituals dedicated to the sun. The historian Massimo Palatoni has opened that they represent the earliest known example of the goldsmith art in Italy. Let's keep going. Coli I Mori, Umbrian Tadino. Excavations carried out in 1935 at the summit of Coli I Mori, some three kilometers north of the modern city. On Earth, the foundations of a small sanctuary that seems to have been used from the 5th century BC, together with bronze together with bronze votive offerings more recent excavations have revealed traces of an associated settlement that was established on three artificial terraces covering about 5 hectar hectares which was occupied for about 300 years from late, from the late 6th century BC it had a fortified circuit that enclosed a number of houses that were apparently composed of several rooms probably on two floors finds from the settlement and the sanctuary can be seen in what's this muso civico I believe that's a museum and here they're just showing you um, the Umbrian inscriptions, part of an originally rectangular limestone. Like these are like the, the Umbrian carvings, right? Uh, there's more. There's a lot to this. Uh, you know. <laughs> so let's skip this whole thing. Let's go down here. Taino. Roman Tadinum. Okay, can, can, can't make this stuff up. I'm gonna drop this link for y'all in the chat. All right, give me one second. Let me uh let me get to it before we read this. One second, fam.
All right. So uh, the link should be in the chat for this here that I'm reading. Let me make sure. Okay, the link should be there now. Just press one in the chat if you guys got the link. Let me know if you guys received the link in the chat. All right. So, Ta Taino Roman Tadina. Excavations carried out in 2004 8 on a site near St. San Antonio de Racina, some three kilometers southwest of modern Gualdo Tadino. All you gotta do is just take the D out and you got Taino. Unearthed the Romans off and on an urbanish, urbanized settlement. The, ca the, the Catasto. Gregoriano, Gregoriano, I cannot, I do not understand Italian, identify this area as Taino, a name that probably derives from the Latin Tadinum. Pay <laughs> attention. According to the website of the, uh, I can, uh, what's that, Direzioni, General Archaeologia, the archaeological evidence indicates that the settlement originated in the first half of the second century BC. It should be viewed in the context of the opening of the Via Flaminia and the abandonment of the pre-Roman center of Kali I Mori. The excavated area lies along the southwest side of a surviving stretch of Via Flaminia. This is a map that they're showing. They're showing Kali I Mori. And it's on Gualdo Tadino. Okay. Like, you, you, you can't make this stuff up. Via Flaminia was built by Caucus Flaminius, the Council of 223 and 217 BC. In his period as censor, in, 20, in 220 BC, it left Rome, see, it left Rome at the Milven, Milvian Bridge, entered Umbria at the Auriculum, where it split into two branches that probably reconverged at Forum Flamini. Slightly north of modern Foligi, Folig, Foligno, it then proceeded to Nuceria, to Tad, Tadinum, and Helvillum, before crossing the Apennines to reach the Adriatic coast. The earliest surviving reference. Anyway, uh, I, I've already butchered this enough, but you guys got the point. Right here, it links back the whole Taino going back to Rome. Tadinum is Taino. All of that goes into Rome. Taino, Tainos, Tainos. All of that is going back into Rome and, Greek, and Greece, right? It's, oh, it just means mixed. It literally, when you, when you walk, go back to the video and you come back into this and you understand the history of Rome, you understand the history of Greece and what was going on through that portion of the world, it literally means mixed race people, right? So 
So this is also going to break down the whole social war, everything like what we're going now through today. We're going through a social war. This is what we're going through now today with social media and all, all these things that's going on out here. And now you have to work twice as hard to break down truth from lies. And you're learning that majority of your old school leaders and these folks actually didn't know. A, they didn't know what they were talking about. Or B, they were misled. Or C, they were misleading you. Okay? Because they, throughout this whole thing here, of this history, they created fraternal and soror societies, which they they construct, they socially construct, or they they program your children from high school, from junior high, high school, that when they get in college, they must join these fraternal orders. And this is how they build their numbers. And is is as crazy as it is, it's not even crazy. Like I said before, we all know people that will sell out. And some of these folks sell out. Some of these folks that don't want to do it, well, you see what ended up happening to a lot of them. Right? Let's go to the next one. And another one. Give me one second, family. It's a few information here, but I, I want to pull up something else to show you guys. I, I, I want to, let me see if I could find it real quick. Let me see if, if it's there, there, there. Please be there. Where are they? Where are they? No, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it either. All right, let me um, let me see what's going on here. I might have to go back into my. Here we go. So I want to screen share this. I want to screen share it. I'm not understanding why it's not screen sharing it. Give me a second, fam. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I took a picture in one of my dictionaries today. And I want you guys to be able to see it. But, right? okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Here we go. And this is from a Noah's Webster's Dictionary. Right? Taino, here, and we're going to read this one first, and then we're going to go through the rest. Now, we know anything that you see, anything here that you will see in boxes, in a bracket, right? The four, the four, I forgot what it's called, it's called the four principles, the four corners rule. The four corners rule, anything within four corners don't does not exist. Most writers know this. Right when they put things in bo in brackets, it means it doesn't exist, or it could also mean that they they're trying to connect something where it needs not to be connected. So here we go. Taino, Taino, or Tainos. This is important too when they added this whole s onto it. And in the bracket, it says of Amerindian origin. Then here outside of the bracket. An extinct Aboriginal Arawakan people of the Greater Antilles and the Bahamas, of Hispanolia, a member of such people, language of the Taino people. <clears throat> right now, yes, they are. They do have connections with Hispanolia, with Hispano, which goes back to Spain. That's originally what that means. That goes back to Spain. Yes, right? So now we're going to go here up top to Tainan, right? Tainan. Off or from the city of Tainan on the island of Formosa, China. 
of the kind of style prevalent in Tainan, right? I'm telling you folks like this, you cannot, like people that ignore this information uh, 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 baffles the mind. All right, so here we go here into where's the other picture give me one second folks trying to get the next the next slide for the other definition one second family on the next picture Oh, now, where are you? Okay, I found it. Let me hit back the uh, screen share. No, this should be it here. Okay. Now, here we go here into Hispano, right? Hispano, a native or resident of the South for Hispano, okay, native or resident of the Southwestern U.S. descended from Spaniards. Descended from Spaniards. Settled there before annexation. Okay. Like you, you can't make this stuff up. Hispano. Comb. Form. Uh, Spanish and Hispano. German. Like. And here we go down here. Hispano. Moresque. Of relating to or produced in the era of Moorish ascendancy in Spain, used chiefly of art, cultural objects, pottery, so on and so. All of this goes back into the whole Taino thing. Okay, let's keep going. All right, let's we'll go into another, another. Let's see, which one should we dip into here now? Um, that. Did that. Did. Let's see. This is. Let's see what this is. Screen share. What? Here we go. Here now. Tanos. Now we're going to go into the word Tanos. Tanos. The Hopi Tewa, also Tano, Southern Tewa, Hano, Sano, or Arizona Tewa, are a Tewa Pueblo group that resides in the eastern part of the Hopi Reservation on or near First Mesa, in northern Arizona, I tell you, on the folks on the reservations, remember, they were given land away to indentured servants, okay, to come and occupy the Americas, to work for free, and then in return, they were going to give them land or to help them conquer the Americas, and in return, they would give them land. Okay. 
let's keep going. That's good. That's where are you? All right. On to the next portion of the screen share. Breaking down words, Thanos, right? This is from uh, Wikishinary, <laughs> the Wikipedia Dictionary dot org. Right. So here, Tano, contents, bicol, central, etymology, pronunciation, noun derives. Uh, let's, let's, let's break down some things. Let's get into it here. Inherited from Proto Philippine language, Tanus. Inherited from Proto Philippine language, Tanus. Pronunciation. Hyphenation ta nos, which goes back into thanos, also. But any, anyway, anyway, let's not get into that right now. Now, tanos, right? Etymology inherited from again Proto Philippine tanos, pronunciation tanos, adjective tanos, direct direction. Direct, erect, straight. Esperanto, verb, tanos, future of tani. Pronunciation, tanos, tanos, uh, tanos, now tanos. An unknown precious stone. That goes back into Thanos and Infinity Stones. But, you know, hey. All right. Now, let's, where was it? Please don't tell me I lost it. Tiny, 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 tiny. Oh gosh, let me let me see if it's on the other thing. There's a there's a kind. Of, I have too much stuff here. Oh, hold on. Give me one second, family. One second. the rest of my screens come on now this hold on oh, that's how many did. History of the Greek island, Tinos. In antiquity, the island was well known for its cult of Poseidon and Am, uh, Amphitrite, Amphitrite. With the advent of the Venetians in the 13th century, Roman Catholicism became predominant following the discovery of an icon of the Panaia Virgin Mary in 1822 by a nun named Pelagia Tinos became a major Greek Orthodox place of pilgrimage. Where is it? Come on, where are you? 
Please don't tell me I lost it. Please don't tell me I lost it. Nietzsche Island was called Tenos and also was called from the number of its springs. And oh, that's not what I'm looking for. I literally had a whole thing that linked the rest of this whole thing together. Uh, don't tell me that's the link that I that I closed out. Please don't tell me that's it. Give me one second, fam. That's a I'll come back and stroll back through these things here. All right. Honor, honor, sister Cherokee. Honor, honor. Let me um one sec. I'm gonna go back through these things here. Uh, that's it. Oh. Tell me, I oh, man, I literally just had it here. Wait, let me see. No, uh, what's this dictionary? Word. Oh, that's not it. Oh, man, this is important. I really have to find this back <clears throat> for you guys. Because this was another key piece. This is another key piece. All right. Oh, man. Don't do me like this. Don't do that. Damn, I think I lost it. I think I lost it, family. I really was trying to. Um, let's see. All right, so let me show. Let me show you guys this. I can't believe I can't find it. There was a. It, it was a definition that tied back all of these things together, and I. I I think that's the, the um that's the page that I, I that's the one that I do I accidentally closed out. But let me let me hit back the screen share. Let me show you guys something something else here. And then we're gonna get back into that also. Oh no, I, I did I did uh, I did give it to you guys. This was the one that I, from the um key, I put the link in the chat. Uh, yeah, the Umbrian inspiration from Taino. Yeah, 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 yeah. I gave it to you guys. According to Simone Sassani and Alberto, Alberto Cal, Calderini, reference below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I gave this. I, I put the link in the chat for you guys. I'm going to put it back in. Oh, I already did. I already did put it in there. Oh. I guess I had just too much stuff. Now I could just let me move on now to this. I already had shared it. 
My bad. My apologies. Let me put back the link in there for y'all. Yep. There it goes. There goes the link. If you guys can see it, it's in the chat. I'll just put the link back in there. All right. Now, now we showed already in the beginning about the the Greeks, the Romans, the Latins, uh, the Italians, uh, the Middle Easterns, uh, folks, right? All of these folks, all these admixture folks, um, you go into the definitions of these words, it goes back to China, the Philippines, these people, all this admixture people, uh, came to, these are the people now today calling themselves Tainos and indigenous to the Americas, all right, which they are not. Now, here in this screen share here, we have an artifact that was found um, in Europe through the whole Roman, the Roman Empire. Come on. There we go. Um, I'm Now, this says visual cultures in Spanish America. All right? The Zemi Front View, 1510 to 1515. Location, Rome. It's a Museo Nacional. Anyway, it's in Rome. Right. It's in Rome. This is where it's at right now. It's in Rome. This was not found in the Americas also. When you go and you look into uh, this artifact here, it wasn't found in the Americas all, neither. It's from, it was found over there in Rome. All right? This version of the artifact here. <clears throat> and then they're going to compare when uh, the versions that they found into the Americas. And you're going to see that what these people did, they left from over one side of the world and they brought their culture some of their culture with them, their artifacts, their statues and stuff um, with them, okay? Because now during the era of when the mass migration of when these folks started coming here, uh, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, they were destroying uh, a lot of the temples, the pillars, <clears throat> the statues, the towns that we had here in the Americas with the faces of the people. This is why when you walk through like the Grand Canyon, walk through portions of Arizona, Utah, uh, California, these places in the mountainous regions, you see big boulder, big, big boulder, big rocks with odd shapes like they were once uh, a structure. And this is what they were doing through, through the age of the gold rush when they had all the coolies that came over here and was blowing up stuff with dynamite, saying that they were making way for railroads and all this. They were blowing up our temples. They were blowing up our statues, our image. Okay. It's called uh, Momento Mori, is what it's called. Momento Mori is what it's called. That's when you get rid of the any evidence of what was existing before you came. That's where you write someone's name out of a history book. It's no difference from getting a, a, your, your yearbook. And everyone in the school decide they're going to mark out the face of one person out of every yearbook and even did it to that person, took that person's yearbook and marked out their face out of the yearbook. Now, you can say you went to the school, right? And you can tell people, yeah, I got it in the yearbook. When you open up the yearbook, no one sees your face because it's marked out. So how do we know it's you? Your name and your face is marked out. The only thing it shows is your hair. This is, this is what was going on. All right. Let's uh, let's see. I think I have one more to share with y'all. I I have one more to share with y'all. I know I got some more stuff, but I don't want to drop that now. Uh, let's go into. What else? Share that already. I shared that already too. Oh, what else? 
else. Fear that. I guess we went through everything, family. Yeah, I guess I guess we went through everything. Wait, what is this? Okay. Now let's 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 go through this one right here. <coughs> So this is saying during ancient times, Tinos was known as Orph Orphiosa or Orphis or Ophis, meaning snake in ancient Greek. Right? Because remember again, the, the Greeks and the Latins came together to create a language. Okay, the, well not the Latin, the Greeks and uh the Oh gosh, I forgot their name. Along with the Romans, they came together and they created the Latin language. Okay. Because of the great number of snakes crawling on the soil of the island and the Rusa Hydria, because of its abundant water, according to ancient Greek mythology, Poseidon, who was the island's protector chased the snakes away from the island and that was the reason he was highly worshipped in Tinos which Tinos Tano all of these go back to Taino okay an important sanctuary to the Poseidon important sanctuary to Poseidon was even dedicated to him in Kionia the first inhabitants in the history of Tinos were probably the Phoenicians, followed by the Lonians in the 11th century BC. Two tombs from the Mycenaean period have been discovered in the area of Kyra Zeni, and about 50 archaeological sites with elements from the geometric period to the 5th century as well as from the era of the Venetian Gizzi family have been found in the area of Zamborgo during the 6th century BC. Tinos was seized by the Eritrea and was seized by Eritrea and during the Median Wars. Now, the Eritrean people to this very day, what do they look like? The island came under the authority of the Persians in 490 BC. The Median Wars, the isle, okay, in 490 BC, the inhabitants of the island regained rapidly their freedom after the Battle of Marathon. Tinos became a member of the the Lion Alliance, who was ruled by Athens and instituted democracy. When I told you there's an alliance. These people always had an alliance. They've always had treaties. Okay. Oh, I'm not sure. Look, let me hit the screen share. My apologies, family. My apologies. So that you guys can see what I'm reading. Right. Okay, it should it should come up now. Okay, it just came up. There it goes. Yeah, so in 386 BC, the island became independent. The new era of Tinos hardly favored prosperity, as it soon came under the authority of Philip of Macedonia. After the death of his son, Alexander the Great, the island was ruled by the Egyptian Ptolemies, the successors of Alexander the Great, 
in the second century BC. Tinos were with all the other islands and the mainland of Greece became a part of the Roman Empire during Byzantine times. The inhabitants moved from the sea town to the interior of the island in order to protect themselves from the many devastating pirate raids, which were in that period the great plague for all the Greek islands. The few things known about Tinos during the Byzantine times is that those were times of epidemics, fear, and insecurity for Tinos as well as for many of the other islands. Now, when did these folks called Tainos started coming out? Like in a massive way during the COVID, during during everything that was going on with COVID. That's when they started coming out in a massive way. That is during that is during chaos, a pandemic, an epidemic. Right, as they as they're saying. So folks aren't looking to go check them and say, "Oh, who are these people?" No, because everyone is distracted. In twelve oh seven, Tinos was conquered by the Venetians, like all Greek islands. The Venetian ruled last longer there than any of the other islands in the Cyclades and the Venetians managed to repulse the Turkish attacks with the help from the locals. As a result, this was a chance for Tinos to flourish in agriculture, art, industry, and more. At the time of the Turkish rule, Tinos had already been a town with many privileges. The inhabitants had the right to wear their local uniform and to build churches and schools. The Turkish fleet was not allowed to come close to the island. The island was self-governed and the only Turkish resident were the governor and the judge. During the Ottoman period, the present-day capital began to develop concentrated shipping and commercial activities. Look, man, you can't make this stuff up. And when you go back again into the definitions that I showed you uh, earlier in the screen share, you'll see where everything connects, where, where it connects. If you go back to the video and you break down back the video, Go back to the stream and you see the video and you hear what they're, they're breaking down in the video. You'll see how everything connects. The folks who are calling themselves Tainos here in, the, in these Americas, claiming to be indigenous to the Americas, they are not. These are the Greek Roman uh, um, folks from that side of the world. Like, family, you know, we must be on point when it comes to this. Must. Let me see if there's anything else left to share. Next time, uh, I'm just going to delete as I go. As I go. No, that's it. That is it, fam. That is it. That's everything so far for today. Everything else that I have is for another time. All right, but I just wanted to share that with you guys because when you sit by and don't say anything, it's called acquiescence. While someone else come and claim your history, claim your land, claim that they are you and they are not you, and when you're claiming something else that you are not, you leave it open for that person to claim eminent domain and take your stuff. And if you're following these patterns of history, what it's showing is once they deemed you as fully the minority and they actually see that you are now an actual minority in numbers, because everywhere you go, you're still majority. 
but your numbers are dwindling. And once they feel like your numbers, it doesn't matter if it's 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, you're going to be on a boat. And they're going to ship you out. Your descendants will be on a boat and be shipped out to be enslaved, non-voluntary indentured servants. This is it, people. Nationality is very important. You know, it's very important. Knowing how to come together to challenge the legalities of a lot of these things through even the court systems is important. Some people say, oh, but the system is rigged, even if that's the case, as long as it's on record that we took it to court. We took these folk, these people to court for rewriting history for the fraudulent acts that they've been committing. These things. We took the UN to court for the cover-up of who we truly are because these people have profited from it financially for generations now. You understand? Well, yeah, family. Well, that being said, I'm about to get up out of here. I say peace, love, light, um, love to you all, much respect to you all. Mr. Nino Brown, especially Navars, Ab- Aboriginal Lone Wolf, Sister Cherokee Tulu, honor, honor to you all, honor to everyone that was in the chat, honor to you guys. All right. Brother Tay, honor, honor. I say peace, everyone. And travel safe if you're on the road. Have a wonderful day. Don't let no one try to get into your head. Don't let no one try to disrupt your, 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 your soulfulness your good spirits, you know what I mean? Um, and if you are not having a good day, I, I truly do wish that it is uplifting, okay? Um, try to treat yourself to something if you can, even if it's some alone time, all right? So I say peace to you guys. Love.